All right, so we're starting a brand new book of the Bible tonight, the book of Matthew. We've been in Old Testament for a while. I figure it's time to get a New Testament book in there. And what a great book, the, the Gospel according to St. Matthew. So we're starting in chapter number one. And this, this chapter is basically broken up into two sections. The first section is all this genealogy in the first 17 verses. And then from there on, it's talking about the birth of Jesus Christ. And we're going to dig right into this. And notice, you, you'll, if you read through the Gospels, you notice that there's two genealogies given in the Gospels. There's one in the book of Matthew and there's one in the book of Luke. And in the book of Matthew, we're probably not going to go through necessarily every single name here. But what this is, this is the line that ends with Joseph. Now, of course, Joseph is the stepfather of Jesus Christ. He is not his father. He doesn't have an earthly Father, although Joseph did help raise Jesus as his son. He just physically wasn't his seed because he was born of the Holy Ghost. And we'll get into that a little bit later when it, when it gets to that part of the chapter. But what this is demonstrating, it's starting off with Abraham. It doesn't start off with Adam. We get the Adamic uh, genealogy in the book of Luke. And that goes all the way back to creation, essentially, this is the kingly line. This is his father's line. This is showing that he is basically in line of all these kings. And ultimately, I believe the reason why it starts with Abraham and it's written the way it is and, and everything's recorded the way it is, is because it's demonstrating that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. It's starting off with Abraham as the starting point. Um, and we're going to get into some verses just, just showing why this is so important here in just a minute. This is the kingly line. It goes through all of the kings of Judah. Because uh, remember, the promise was made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And then later on, David was made the promise that there, you know, of his loins, there was going to be a king upon the throne forever. And of course, Jesus Christ is born of the tribe of Judah and he's born of the lineage of David. And um, you know, he's Jesus Christ is the child of promise. And this is all extremely important. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, later on in the New Testament, tells us to avoid genealogies. That for us, for now, we don't need to worry about where we come from and tracing back our descendants and everything else. But back in the Old Testament, it was important, but it wasn't important necessarily for some of the reasons why some people may say they think it's important. It wasn't important because God is a respecter of persons and that you had to be a Hebrew by birth in order to be one of God's people. It, that's not why it was important even back in the Old Testament. Because what you'll notice, especially as we go through this, uh, this genealogy here, there are people referenced in the genealogy of Jesus Christ who are not Hebrews. How about Ruth? Ruth was a Moabitess. And she is directly in the line going right before King David. There are other people mentioned that are not physical Hebrews. She was not. Now, now her husband may have been, but she wasn't, right? And obviously, when two people come together, you've got the DNA of both. So all of a sudden, you're not this pure blood, genetically pure Hebrew. Jesus wasn't. If that was super important to God, don't you think that Jesus Christ would have been? If that was something that truly mattered? No, this demonstrates that it wasn't. Now, there were some rules on who can be priests and who could enter into the house of the Lord to do, to do God's service. And basically, it just couldn't be certain of the heathen that were supposed to be stamped out already anyways. That that, that was not allowed. But over and over again, we see people converting uh, to become part of the nation of Israel. So that's what matters. Now, the reason why this genealogy matters is because there were prophecies made about Jesus Christ specifically. And every word of God, every, every word of God that's spoken needs to come to pass. And this is demonstrating that the promises that were made, you know, 14 generations, 14 generations, and 14 generations previously, right? That those all came to pass and were coming to pass right here with the birth of Jesus Christ. There are so many prophecies that were given in the Old Testament about Jesus Christ. One of them has to do with 
his genealogy with his birth and, and how this came into being, which is why we're getting the details here, which is also why we get the details. And there's a little bit slightly different purpose in the book of Luke. But I'm not going to get into all the differences between the two genealogies tonight. Let's see why this is so important, though, uh, that this is starting off with Abraham. Turn, keep your place here in Matthew and flip over to, to the book of Galatians. We're at Galatians chapter number three. Galatians 3, and then we're also going to look at Genesis chapter 17. This is important to see that Jesus Christ was physically a son of Abraham, which is why it's starting with Abraham. And if you go to Galatians chapter 3, we're going to look down at verse number 6. The Bible says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And this is a theme that you're going to find throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. Romans chapter 4 says, Even as Abraham um, believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, we're seeing the same exact thing in Galatians chapter 3. People were never saved by the works of the law. If people were saved by the law, by the keeping of the commandments, by the animal sacrifices, then why did Jesus even have to come? If it were possible for a soul to be saved any other way, you wouldn't need the sacrifice that God gave of his only begotten son to die on the cross, to go to hell and to raise again from the dead to pay for our sins, if they were possible outside of that. But it's not possible outside of that. It never has been. Even as Abraham, verse 6, believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now this is really important because the Bible is saying that the gospel... Now, we know all about the gospel today. What's the gospel? The gospel is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. The gospel is the good news. It's the good news of our salvation. Well, the gospel was preached unto Abraham way before Jesus was ever born. And what it says there, it says, saying when, when he was given the gospel, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Referring to the fact that Jesus Christ was in Abraham you know, as his, as his progenitor waiting to be born. So that gospel that Abraham was looking for was to the future, to when that descendant was born that was going to take away the sins of the whole world. That was Jesus Christ. And we're starting with Jesus showing that, hey, this is the same gospel that was preached unto Abraham. Now he's the fulfillment of the gospel in that sense. Look at verse number 9. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now jump down to verse number 16. The Bible reads, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So when Abraham was, was given a promise by God, God made a promise to Abraham and to his seed. The Bible is very clear here. That's not just talking about the physical descendants, the physical Hebrews. As I already mentioned earlier, God's not a racist where only Jews are his special people that just get some free pass into heaven. Yeah, right. It's not the way it works. Now, he did choose a nation. He did choose the Jews to represent him here on earth, but he did not choose them to just automatically be saved and that they're just better than everybody else. No, in fact, God warned them multiple times saying, don't think that it's because you're so good that I'm doing all these things for you. Even when he brought them into the promised land, he delivered them out of Egypt, he was letting them know, hey, look, don't get a big head about you. Don't think it's for your righteousness because there's a twofold purpose for him bringing them out of Egypt into the promised land. One was because of the promises he already made unto Abraham. And two was because of the wickedness of the nations that were in that land that God wanted to be destroyed and to bring his judgment upon. It's not because those people were so great, those physical Hebrews. It's not the reason. 
And he tells us here in verse 16, let's reread that. Now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made, he saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So he's drawing a very clear distinction between a plural and a singular. He's saying the promise wasn't made to everybody, to the plural, to the, just the plurality of descendants. It was made to one. One descendant, one seed, and that seed was Christ. Verse 17, And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And here he's just bringing up the distinction that the gospel that was preached unto Abraham was a gospel of promise. The promise was that the seed was going to come that Jesus Christ was going to come, that, that he was going to come and bring salvation unto all people. That, that's the gospel. That's the promise. The law came after that. After that promise, the law was given unto Moses. And the law was not given to say, well, we don't really think that this promise is going to come true, so now we just need to keep things by this law and then you'll be good. No, it doesn't disannul that promise. In fact, the law was given as a schoolmaster just to show people that you need that promise. To show people that we need to be relying on the promise of God because we're not good enough to make it on our own. That's why the law was given. So there's no aspect of keeping the law that is a necessity or a part of our own salvation. Flip back, if you would now, please, to Genesis chapter 17. I want to point this out because one of the things that we see here in the book of Matthew is that Jesus was named before he was even born. And we're going to get into a little bit more of that later as well. But you, if you've seen that already, the angel comes to Joseph and he says, you're going to call his name Jesus. Now, the same thing happened with John the Baptist when Zechariah saw an angel in the temple and and. You know, remember, he wasn't able to speak until the child was born and actually wasn't able to speak until he wrote down, we're going to call his name John, yeah. right? Even after he was born, he still couldn't speak. It wasn't until he, he finally said, okay, yeah, we're going to call his name John because that's what the angel told him to name him. And this doesn't happen that often in scripture, but there is another place where this happens and this happens with the birth of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Isaac is also known as a child of promise. Remember, I'm just trying to illustrate in Matthew 1, why is it so important we're starting off the genealogy with Abraham? Because of all of the symbolism that goes along with the coming of Jesus Christ. This is all important. Everything in the Old Testament leading up to the birth of Christ, even just within the genealogy, is extremely important. Isaac is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. He had a miraculous birth. We, we were reading here about the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1, how he was born of a virgin. That's a miracle, folks, that this doesn't happen. Physically, naturally, you need a man and a woman, the seed of a man and the egg of a woman to come together, to be brought together and to have that conception. But Jesus was conceived of the Holy Ghost without man being involved. That was a miracle. Likewise, in a similar manner, when Abraham was 99 years old and Sarah was, I believe, 80 years old, it already records, you know, the time of women. It's already passed for her. She had already, you know, gone into her non-childbearing years. Yet the promise was made that a, a son was going to be born unto Sarah and Abraham, and that was going to be uh, Isaac. And Isaac was also named prior to um, his birth. Look at Genesis chapter 17, verse number 19. The Bible says, And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Now this is important 
again, because he is the child of promise and this is an everlasting covenant that's being established um, from, the, from the son of Abraham, which also is promised unto Jesus Christ. Now, uh, turn over, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. I know we're getting, we're kind of going all over the place, but um, this is just an important groundwork that we need to lay here on this genealogy. Romans chapter 9. And there's many other times we're going to see in the scripture where Isaac is a, uh, a type of Jesus, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. We see when Abraham was, was told to bring Isaac, his son, up to sacrifice him, right? And, they, and he almost went through with sacrificing his son Isaac. And the reason why the Bible tells us that he almost did that is one, he was stopped by an angel, which is why he was going to do it. He was going to sacrifice his son. But two, he knew that God's promises never fail and he had the faith and knew that God was able even to raise him up again from the dead. He knew the power of God. He knew the gospel and he believed wholeheartedly that when God makes a promise, he doesn't back out on it. That's, by the way, why we could be so sure that we're going to heaven when we die because when God promises eternal life, God doesn't back out on the promise. He doesn't say, oh, wait, yeah, I know I said it was forever, but I'm actually going to take that back. Here, give me that back to me now. No, it's forever. It's eternal. It's everlasting. It cannot end. The word of God return, never returns void. It is fulfilled every single time. Romans chapter 9, verse number 4. And of course, that illustration with, uh, with Isaac, he carries the wood on his back, just like Jesus bare his cross. He goes up to that altar, right? And they bind his arms out and he's about to, to kill him uh, just as Jesus was the sacrifice for the whole world. And there's, there's many other things too. I'm not going to get into all those. You could go back and read through the lives of, of many people who were a, a picture of Jesus Christ who was to come. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse number 4. The Bible says, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law, and the service of God, excuse me, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So this is the, the reason why I started in verse 4, we're talking about the Israelites, and it's saying they're the fathers, and, and concerning the flesh, Jesus Christ came of the line of the Israelites, which is absolutely true, and we see this in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, look at verse number 6. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed." Now, because it was prophesied that Jesus Christ was going to come in the flesh of these people, it's recorded here that he came in the flesh. But what's more important and what is often stressed and what we see here in Romans 9, 8, is that what really matters is that it's the children of promise. And more important than Jesus Christ even being born physically of the seed of David was that it was prophesied and promised that he was going to come, that it was promised that Jesus Christ was going to come, the lamb to take away the sins of the whole world. That is what's important. Because any prophecy of future events is basically a promise. When God says this is going to happen and then it comes to pass, that's a promise. Just as the promise was to Abraham and to Sarah, you're going to have a child and it's going to be Isaac. And Abraham was like, well, what about Ishmael? And, well, you know, and they tried to do all these other things. To, to, to have children and whatever else. But God said, no, I made this promise unto you and I'm going to keep it even, when, even if you think, you know, I can't keep it anymore. God can perform miracles and he just demonstrates his power even further. Now, let's... Um, I already brought up this point, but in Matthew 1.5, of course, we see... And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. So Ruth there is, is the same Ruth from the book, of, the book of Ruth. 
and Ruth was a Moabitess. And while the genealogy does matter, as I mentioned, as far as being a son of Abraham and fulfilling prophecy, we, we, we cannot help but notice that God decided to include people even in this list, not just in, in fact, because we could have looked back and understood by, just by reading the book of Ruth that Ruth married Boaz, right? And if you just saw Boaz in the genealogy, we could have potentially just deduced that, oh, well, uh, that must have been, you know, there, his son must have been born of Ruth because he got married to Ruth and we saw that. But you wouldn't really know that definitively necessarily because you could say, well, what if she died and he married someone else and had a son with her, you know. No, God made it a point to put Ruth in here. And um, I think it's just to point out that the genealogy has nothing to do with being a pure blood Hebrew. Now, let's jump down here because there's all these kings. Now, you're going to see from David on down all these kings of Judah from the house of David that ruled and reigned. And it goes all the way to verse 16. It says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So he follows down and even gives the names of other people from when they were taken captive and everything else and all the way up until the times of Jesus that had they continued to be in power, these would have been the people who would have been kings, ending with, here, Jesus Christ. Of course, Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and that he is going to sit on, on the throne and rule. He's going to rule on this earth for a thousand years, but he is a, a king forever. Now, um, Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So there's these subdivisions of 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations leading up to Christ. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, Now the birth of Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's so much information here, it's important to read it very carefully. And I'm not going to preach on this really at all. But in this story, because I just preached on this a couple weeks ago, when it has to do with um, getting a divorce. So we see in this story that Joseph, when he finds out that Mary is with child because he's espoused, as we see in verse 18, Mary was espoused to Joseph. They were married. That's, you know, you call it your, your husband, your wife, your spouse. She was espoused unto Joseph. But they had not yet consummated the marriage yet. So yes, they had been married, but no, it wasn't consummated yet. Obviously, because she was still a virgin, when she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Of the Holy Ghost means it's from the Holy Ghost. And what Joseph wanted to do here, it says in verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So the Bible says he was a just man. Just meaning he was following God's law. Right? He wanted to obey the laws of God and in the law of God, he didn't want to, although he could have, he didn't want to make her a public example. He didn't want to make a big show of this and a big deal. Oh, Mary's pregnant. Can you believe this? You know, I want, you know, we got married and she has a, you know, she's with child. I didn't know that, you know, whatever. And, and just make a big deal out of it and kind of drag her name down for playing a whore against him because that's what he would think, right? I mean, that's what any man would think, and except for this one situation, that would have been the case. But it says, he, wasn't, he didn't want to make a public example, he says, but he was minded to put her away privily. So he's thinking, you know what, though, I can't deal with this. I mean, she's, she's got a child from someone else, and I don't think I want to be married to her anymore. So in God's law, if it was for fornication, which is what, something that would have happened before they came together, before they got married, that would have been acceptable in God's law for him to get a divorce. And that's the only time when it's acceptable in God's law to get a divorce. So, 
I'm not going to go through all that because I, I just preached a couple weeks ago. If you're interested in that subject, you can look up the sermon. It's online. Um, but then an angel appears unto Joseph while he's thinking about all these things because obviously it's a big deal. I mean, if you just find out, man, my wife, like I just got married and my wife is pregnant and we haven't even come together yet. That's a big deal. It's pretty heavy. Bible says verse 20, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So he's saying, okay, Joseph, don't worry about this because it's actually of God. It's of the Holy Ghost is the reason why she's pregnant. Um, and that's actually the reason why, you know, Jesus Christ throughout the Bible in the New Testament, you're going to see he's referred to as the son of man. He's also referred to as the son of God. He's the son of man because he was born of a woman, a physical human being woman. He's a son of man. He was, he was a human being. He was here in the flesh, but he's the son of God because he was born of the Holy Ghost. Because it was the Holy Ghost that brought forth that conception that allowed for Jesus Christ to be born physically into this world. Therefore, he's the Son of God. And Luke 1.35 says, uh, it's basically recounting the same story. Luke 1.35 says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So he says, Therefore... That child, that thing that's going to be born, is going to be called the Son of God. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow thee, the power of the highest. And that's why uh, he's going to be born. And that's why he's going to be called the Son of God. So a lot of, I mean, some people you might run into are a little confused about, about you know, why is it that he's called the Son of Man, the Son of God? Well, that explains it very perfectly there. Now, I just want to point out one thing. Luke 1.35, where I just quoted, that is one reason why Jesus is called the Son of God. But that doesn't mean that that's the only reason why he's called the Son of God, and that doesn't mean that he, he only just first started becoming known as the Son of God when he was physically born. And there's, you know, we believe in the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ enjoyed a relationship with God the Father, where Jesus as the Son, going back to eternity past. And I've already preached a sermon on the eternal sonship of Christ when we started this church, and um, I think that's clearly what the Bible teaches. I just want to point that out, because yes, people on earth are going to call Jesus Christ the Son of God because he was um, born of the Holy Ghost. There is no denying that's what the Scripture says, absolutely. But there are other reasons why Jesus Christ is also referred to as the Son. I mean, even in the Old Testament, we see when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the burning, fiery furnace, and there was the fourth that was walking with them that was like the Son of God, right? There was a Son of God being referenced throughout the Old Testament. People knew it's the Son of God. It's not just because they were referring to the Holy Ghost coming upon somebody and giving birth. They didn't even realize that at that point. But anyways, I don't want to go too far off the rabbit trail on that. Now, you noticed I brought in some extra stuff that I don't normally have during my sermons. I've got some speakers here because I want to play something for you tonight. And I actually want, I, I decided to do this because I think it's important to demonstrate how false teachers work. And because we're in this passage, there's a, there's a man that, that teaches and preaches. He's a traveling evangelist. And he's a wicked person. He's a false prophet. But he has a pretty decent-sized following. And one of the things he's known for is teaching on the King James Bible, being the Word of God, which we believe. We, we are King James only. We, we believe that to be true. And he's a Baptist and all these other things, right? And he has his following. His name's Sam Gipp. Okay. Now, recently, I would say, I don't know how recent, maybe in the past year or two, I don't know exactly how long ago it was when all this stuff happened. But I saw, I saw a video of him preaching a sermon. And it was the weirdest thing, what, what he was teaching, 
But I can see how crafty he is and how so many people might just not really think about what's being taught. But I wanna, I'm going to play for you parts of what he taught. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll explain it all here just in a minute, and I'm going to play it for you. So you can hear it for yourself, but I'm going to tell you what to look out for. Because when I heard this, it blew me away what he said. Basically, what he has people do is he turns to the book of Matthew. Now, before we go any further, I'm going to explain this in just a minute. I want you to see, first of all, why I'm doing this. Turn to, uh, keep a place it here in Matthew 1, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Because, first of all, it's important that we never handle the Word of God deceitfully. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1, you're turning to Ephesians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceit deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. There are people out there that intentionally pervert the word of God to deceive people, to trick people. Right. They are the wolves in sheep's clothing. They are these pastors and these preachers that get up and many of them have a good following and a lot of people think they're great men of God but they are setting traps and lying in wait to deceive. And Sam Gipp is one of those people. Yeah, amen. And I'm going to prove it to you by, by exposing his teaching, which has already been exposed, but I want to lay it out and just be very clear that this isn't just some mistake. Because I also have a video where, where he's following up on what was pointed out. It's one thing for somebody to make a mistake, and let's just say it's an honest mistake, right? Just, just right off the bat, someone makes an honest mistake, they're just totally wrong, they're not understanding what they're reading, and they make just a really bad mistake when they're preaching. Okay, that can happen to people. That could happen to people who are saved, that could happen to good people, just, just either preaching on something that they shouldn't be because they don't understand it, or just really misspeaking. Neither one was the case with what he said here. And it's evident because instead of saying what, what, a, what a person would normally do, if someone pointed out, wow, what you said is just totally wrong and completely inaccurate and just, you know, what, when you see the evidence and, and why, the person should say, you're right. I was wrong. I screwed up. And, and maybe, if anything, try to cover up, just be like, well, yeah, I didn't really mean that. But, you know, this is, you know... This is right, and, I, and, and what I said there was wrong, and just own up to it. But he didn't do that. He, he instead played word games to dance around um, what he actually said. Now, you're in Ephesians 4, look at verse number 14. The Bible says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There's people using cunning craftiness and they're lying in wait to deceive. They're trying to trick people and they trick people with the Bible. Yeah. They're going to take scripture and try to turn it on its head and deceive people and trick people with the scripture. That's right. Sam Gibb is one of these people. Now, we're in Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse number 21. Actually, we'll just look at verse number 20. We already read this. We're going to look at it again. What does the Bible say? But while he thought on these things, Joseph, Joseph is thinking about divorcing his wife, right? Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So now he's met with this angel in a dream, and he's, he's told, don't worry about what uh, what happened because the Holy Ghost made Mary conceive. Verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And I don't know what your Bible looks like, but in my Bible, Jesus is all in caps. And thou shalt name his name Jesus. 
That is the name you're going to call him, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, what Sam Gipp taught, and I'm going to paraphrase, but I'm going to give you the meaning of what he said, and we're going to listen to it, and you tell me if he meant anything different when he was preaching. But what he was teaching, what he was preaching, was that Jesus wasn't really supposed to be named Jesus, that Joseph decided to name him Jesus, and that what he was really supposed to be called was Emmanuel. What he does when he brings people to this passage is he doesn't read verse 21 and he starts in verse 22. Verse 21 is undoubtedly telling Joseph explicitly to call, Je to call the name Jesus. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. It's not that big of a secret. But when a preacher or a pastor is preparing a sermon, you're going to read the context of the passage at least one verse before you're going to start reading if you're going to be making a point about something. The fact that he left out this verse is intentional because it contradicted what he was going to teach and what he was going to preach. Now, why is this such a big deal, him saying that it shouldn't have been the name of Jesus? Because there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved than under the name of Jesus Christ. Because the name of Jesus is a name that's above all names given in heaven and earth. Amen. That the name of Jesus Christ is extremely important. And to say that all of a sudden, oh, well, that just really shouldn't have even been his name. Or to imply that, because when he comes back and says, well, I didn't say that there was a mistake. But that's exactly what he's taught. You know what he said? When he taught about this, he says, well, he came unto his own and his own received him not. Referring to the naming of the child. Right. Now, Jesus Christ coming into his own and his own receiving him not is referring to the Jews putting him to death. Right. It's not referring to Joseph naming the child. Right. Right. Oh, we didn't, we didn't receive him because we named him something else. No, Joseph did what was right. Joseph named him with the name that the angel told him to name him. But what he does is he starts reading in verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So because there's a fulfillment of prophecy here, that's why this verse is being referenced. This verse isn't being referenced to tell us, hey, his name was supposed to be Emmanuel. Now what does it actually say? It says, they doesn't say Joseph is going to call his name Emmanuel. It says, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. We notice in the Bible, many times, people have more than one name. People are called more than one thing. How about Peter? Cephas, right? Simon. What was his name Simon? But then his name is changed to, to Cephas, but yet he's still referred to as Simon sometimes. Abram was called Abraham. Many people get different names and, and, and they're, they apply to them. Jesus has more, had more than one name, but you know what his name was when he was named at birth was Jesus. That's right. And that's the name that is the most important. Amen. He shall be called Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. He's going to be called these things. But you know what his name was? His name was Jesus Christ. He's called a lot of things, and this is just referring to one more of those things he's going to be called. Why? Because it's the truth about him, because it'd be God with us. Because that is true. And he goes on, and we'll, we'll listen to it again. I'll listen to it in just a minute. You'll hear him. He just goes on about, well, Emmanuel in the Hebrew means, you know, El is God, so Emmanuel means God with us. He just like adds that in there to make himself sound like real smart, like, well, in the Hebrew... Well, the Bible just said it means God with us. We don't need you to expound on the Hebrew that the Bible just did for us, you know, to make yourself sound a little bit smarter in doing that translation. So let's, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a clip for you. 
I had this all lined up on my laptop, but AT&T cut our internet. But we're still going to do this because I still have internet on my phone. All right, so we're going to listen to this clip. Hopefully you can hear it. And I want you to just pay attention to what he's teaching. Now that we've already looked at this, this passage and we've looked at the verse and we look at what it says, right? Follow along with what he's saying here. get this turned up. Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to start from the beginning. Let me, let me show you something. Go to Matthew chapter 1. It's just better to look at the book for this. Yeah, it's better to look at the book. It is better to look at the book. Amen. Always look at the book. Matthew chapter 1. Look one verse earlier than where he turns to. immoral, that's what he thinks. And so he wants to put her away quietly, and an angel comes and talks to him. Can anybody guess the name of the angel? Absolutely. It was Gabriel. It wasn't Michael, because he continues on. Anyway, and, and look what it says. Verse 30, uh, 23. Behold, oh, verse 22. He gets Gabriel now, from Luke 3, the or from Luke 1. The was which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Remember these words. God. So he goes and writes it on the board. He's right. Us. Remember that, like, focus on this. You know right? Focus you on say, Emmanuel. Focus Emmanuel, on. The E-L is God. Emmanuel, you are saying God with us. This is how false prophets work. Somebody's name. I preached for a guy named Emmanuel in the uh, Philippines. So he's going to go on and on about Emmanuel, 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 Emmanuel. He's going to keep on focusing on this Emmanuel means God to distract you from so what's in the this book. Angel comes to Joseph and says, don't put away. This thing is of God, and this baby's name is going to be Emmanuel. And this baby's name is going to be Emmanuel. You notice that? He said, that's what the angel said. Is that what the angel said? Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, uh, from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth the firstborn son, and called his name Emmanuel. Now, what's he implying right there? Well, he called him Emmanuel. He said, hey. He's saying that the angel told Joseph to call him Emmanuel. Right. That is an outright lie. That is completely not true. One verse earlier explicitly tells you that he, the angel said to call his name Jesus. That's right. So what he's doing now, what he's implying now is that, well, Joseph is in rebellion to God because the angel speaking the word of God unto Joseph and he's implying that Joseph is in rebellion to God in rebellion to the angel and says, you know what? I'm just going to call his name Jesus. That's right, this is what gets me fired up because these guys are a bunch of phony liars. Right. This isn't a simple mistake. This isn't an oops. Right. This is a devil who hates God who hates the name of Jesus, who said Jesus is not his Messiah, yeah, that has a following that people want to just hold their ears and stop what they're seeing and just blindly accept a man that has become their friend instead of having integrity to the word of God. Yeah, that's right. We'll finish this off here. Hey, you have a kid? His name's going to be Emmanuel. He says, hey, Joe, she has a baby. What do you call it? Jesus. What? How could that be? Real simple. God with us. The Bible says he came unto his own. And his own How could that be? He came unto his own, his own received him not. So we're saying Jesus, Joseph didn't receive Jesus. Jesus. Or didn't receive Emmanuel, called him what Jesus. Jesus mean? It means Jehovah saves. Oh, that's what we need, isn't it? What? We need Jehovah saves. But he never. The audacity. He's mocking what Jesus' name means. 
Oh, yeah, that's what we need, Jehovah saves. That is what we need. Right. Of course we need Jehovah saves. We need God with us, and we need Jehovah saves. And he's a fool, and he's a false prophet, right. and no one ought to be deceived by what he's saying. And I want you to be aware and watch out for people like this, because you never know where you might go and visit another church. You might be somewhere else. Who knows what's going to happen? You hear preaching somewhere. Watch out for the wicked false prophet. And you use this word of God to judge every man and every preacher and everything that you hear. Amen. Forgot this. Now, I, I mentioned yesterday or sometime earlier, before the Lord came to the manger, the Trinity was in heaven. Nobody ever said, let's go by the throne and see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They said, let's go by the throne and see the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. He got that name Jesus when he was born. Now, one of these days, the Lord's going to come back. He's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. He's going to rule the universe, correct? And nobody is going to say, well, let's go to Jerusalem and see Jesus. They're going to say, let's go to Jerusalem and see God with us. You say, are you sure about that? No. <laughs> He's saying no one's going to call Jesus Jesus when he comes back to rule on this earth. They're going to call him Emmanuel. This isn't an accident. The reason why I decided to play this tonight, it's an older issue. I don't think anyone here is like deceived by Sam. I mean, maybe some of you have heard of him before or have a book by him. Look, I've got a book from Sam Gipp. Way back a long time ago when I was newly saved, I went with my brother. We visited a church somewhere. I'm actually kind of mad because if it wasn't for Sam Gipp, I wouldn't have sinned that night the way that I did. But the way, how did I sin that night? I bought a book in church. I bought a book from Sam Gipp. Jesus said not to make my, my, my house uh, or my father's house a house of merchandise. And you know what he did when he, when he drove out the people? He drove out those that bought and sold. That's right. Right. Bought and sold. It's not just the people selling that's the problem. It's the people buying also. Right. I bought a stupid book. That is a stupid book. I've never even finished reading it cover to cover. I couldn't do it. I bought a book on the book of Acts because it's my favorite book in the whole Bible. And I'm thinking like, this is going to be great. I love the book of Acts. It's exciting. It's full of all this stuff. His book is so boring. <laughs> it's like, it's horrible. I couldn't even make it through the whole thing. But, um, but yeah, that, that, that irritates me still now that I went and I bought that book in church uh, when I should have done that. Now, I'm going to play for you his rebuttal because after when Pastor Anderson heard this, he put out a video, you know, and he was fired up about it. And you could probably understand why. Because it's kind of the same reasons why I'm fired up about it tonight. Because when you hear a devil preaching blasphemy like that, and just bringing down the name of Jesus, and mocking the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's what we need. Jehovah saves. It's the same way that Tyler Baker mocked the sacrifice that God gave of his only brother. Oh, yeah, here, you go off and die for him. As if that's some light thing for a father to give his only begotten son. And making light and setting naught by the sacrifice that God made for our salvation and just spitting in the face of God. That makes me angry. Here's, his, here's Sam Gipp's rebuttal then. Because if you wanted to say, well, you know, maybe he just made a mistake. He just didn't read that verse. He prepared his sermon, and that's what came in his mind, and he wanted to teach that. That's a pretty serious mistake. That's not something you cover up. That would be something I'd say, like, wow, you are totally right. I was completely wrong. You know why he doesn't say that? Because he's blind. Because he doesn't understand the scripture. So he justifies what he does. First of all, this is real interesting too. He says, what he does here is, because is, he's responding to Pastor Anderson. And what Pastor Anderson did was, he did what I did, giving a summary of what he taught. 
Now, the summary is that he's implying that Joseph made a mistake by calling him Jesus. Is that, is that unclear to anybody? I mean, isn't that what he taught? So he tries to pick apart Pastor Anderson's words, and he quotes Pastor Anderson saying, he made this charge that Joseph and Mary named Jesus mistakenly. And then he goes, now he has to say that because you'll never hear me say that. I listened to all of Pastor Anderson's video, and I'm not going to play another video. I'm going to play this one. You can listen to his response. He never uses the word mistakenly one time, but that's what Sam Gape accuses him of saying. Now, <laughs> for a guy who wants to nitpick on the words, he's still not even quoting Pastor Anderson right. Now, I do think it's important to quote people right. What I just read you here, I, I, that's why I said I'm paraphrasing what he was teaching. That's also why I played it for you so you could hear it for yourself. And I wrote down the quote that he just said, that I, I just read that for you, that he says that, um, that Joseph and Mary named Jesus mistakenly, because that is exactly what he says here. But that's not, he, he's trying to quote Pastor Anderson, but that's not what Pastor Anderson said. So he misquotes him. But here's his, here's his response. Message. Guys, that's simply not true. That is simply not true. And he's got first class video. Uh, so uh, he made this video and he made this charge that I said that uh, Joseph and Mary named Jesus mistakenly. Now, See how he's making a he big word of that word mistakenly? You'll never hear me say that. Yeah, he didn't. He he's right. He didn't say that. Believe that. But he taught the same thing. Guys, you've seen what the liberals do with 20 second sound bites. They take a conservative that they hate. They have him saying something, and then they add to it. And so uh, he shows it. Goes on and on. I don't want to listen to that guy anymore. This is what the charlatans do. They go, oh, look over here. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. The sleight of hand people, That's right. they distract you with this, yeah. and you don't see what's coming the other way. They want you thinking on something else instead of what's true. Get focused on, oh, he said mistakenly. Oh, so it must be say he taught that what they did was against what the angel told them to do. And that's completely false. And that is exactly what Sam Gipp taught. Anyone with, with half a brain cell that hears what he taught can understand that and can hear that. Does he sound repentant at all for the heresy? No. He's doubling down on it. Watch out for the guy. Watch out for, all, that's just one example of a false prophet. There's many false prophets out there. It's important to understand just a little bit about how they operate. What to look out for when you, maybe you read a book, maybe you hear preaching from someone. Maybe you go to a church, it's a good church, and you hear someone preaching. Don't ever let your guard down on what you hear coming from the Word of God. Don't ever do it. We're all responsible to God for what we believe. So what I preach, check it. Make sure it's right. If I have someone else come in here and preach, check it. Make sure it's right. You go to some other church, you hear a preacher, check it. Make sure it's right. And the only way you're going to know if it's right is if you're reading your Bible for yourself. Anyone who knows the story of the birth of Christ should be able to recognize, hold on a second, that doesn't sound right to me at all. Joseph wasn't supposed to name him Jesus? How could anybody listening to that think there's any merit to that at all? let alone the pastor that gets up after the sermon, oh, great job, brother. I'm sorry, but if I hear just rank heresy like that, that's not a difference of opinion. That's just, that's just false and wicked. I'm going to correct that. And hopefully that never even happens within this church, but let's continue. We're going to finish off this chapter. One last point I want to make and this is something that, that's been coming up even in news lately, and it has to do with being with child. 
and conceiving and, and you know, the life that's inside of a woman when, when a woman is pregnant is a person, is a human being, is a child. It's not just a clump of cells. It's not just any other name you want to give it that's not a child. It is a child. Now, I've read some things and saying, like, we shouldn't get too excited about the law that passed in Alabama and all this other stuff and that it's just a big charade and whatever. I don't know if that's true or not. I just kind of rejoice in the fact, though, that it's being brought up more and there appears to be more support for that way of thinking that even, you know, criminalizing a doctor for murdering a baby, that's a good thing. All that we got left is just institute the death penalty for it. That's right. <laughs> and then we'll be right in line with the Bible. I, don't th I personally don't think it's just some distraction. I mean, this is really happening. If it was just supposed to be some distraction, why would they do it at all? I mean, there's lots of other ways to distract people. I don't know why you would pick something righteous, because that is righteous, to, to ban and outlaw abortions. That is righteous. That's a good thing. That's what you want to have people motivated about and fired up about and saying, yeah, let's keep on doing this in more places. How would you not? I don't see it as a bad thing. But, maybe, I mean, and, but granted, I didn't read all the law. I don't know all the details of it and everything else. Maybe it is a law with no teeth. I don't know. But um, I like the direction that it's going at the very least. So what we're going to see here, though, I want to point out in Matthew chapter 1, Bible says in verse 20 at the very end, it says, Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, it says that when, as his mother Mary was the spouse of Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So she was already found with child. The same thing is being referred to as she was, um, she conceived of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in Matthew 1, 23, behold, a virgin shall be with child. This is the prophecy that's taken from Isaiah. A virgin shall be with child. This is quoted, and you'll see quotations in the New Testament from the Old Testament. So this is a quote. The quote in Isaiah 7, it comes from Isaiah 7, 14, and you might want to just make reference of this if you ever want to prove that life begins at conception and that conceiving seed is the same thing, exactly the same thing, according to the Bible, as being with child. So that anybody, any someone, anyone who claims to believe Scripture, but wants to say that it's okay to have the morning after pill, to abort a baby at any stage after the life has begun, you can show them this truth from the Bible and say, you're wrong. God considers that a child. No matter how small it's a child. We don't put a height limitation or a weight limitation on a child. It's not, oh, well, once they get to be six inches long, then they're a child. Why does that matter? Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. That is quoted in Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Conceive, be with child, synonymous. That's what it teaches you. When it uses different words in a quotation of Scripture, of God's Word that can't be changed, it is a synonym. It means the exact same thing. So instead of saying conceive, they said be with child because those are identical. That's what it means to conceive. It means to be with child. You know what it means to be with child? It means you conceived. Same thing. The Bible says also, to further prove this, in 2 Samuel 11, verse 5, And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. In the same one verse, when Bathsheba became pregnant, she let David know, I conceived and told him, I'm with child. As soon as she realized she conceived, she said, I'm with child. Right away, I'm with child. And just so you understand what conception is, because science may try to change the definition of conception, 
Conception isn't an implantation on the uterus wall. Conception is the moment that a seed is conceived because as soon as that conception takes place, the seed really doesn't exist anymore. The seed and the egg are, are, are one, right? They've merged together, they've conceived, and it's no longer a seed or an egg. Now you have a child. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Conceived seed. So that when the moment that seed is conceived, you have a life. You have a child. This is also why you need to be careful with, and, and in many cases, just not even get involved with and not do things that are going to end life, such as birth control, the pill. What the pill does, in addition to uh, trying to prevent eggs from being produced from a woman's reproductive system, right? It, uh, if I understand the percentages correctly, it's about 80% of the time a woman will not produce an egg during her regular cycle if you're taking the pill. Which means about 20% of the time, or 10%, or whatever the statistics are, it doesn't matter exactly what the statistics are, but it is a fact that it is not 100% effective in preventing eggs from being produced. So what, it did, what they did with the drug is that they made a backup plan to make the drug more effective. And what it did was it made the uterus a, a hostile environment for a conceived seed and egg to implant, for a child to actually implant on the uterus in order to be sustained, in order to grow, in order to become, you know, go full term and be born into this world. So what happens as a result is that you'll have conception take place and then the body flush it out because of the drugs that were being taken. They're known as silent abortions because you don't even have to go into the doctor to have them perform a surgery to cut out the child, you've already done that through the drugs that you've ingested into your body to make your body do that. And you are just as guilty. You are just as guilty because that is a life. No matter how many days or weeks old that life is, when you do things to cause the death of a child, of you, especially your own child, just call it what it is. That's murder. A lot of people don't like to hear that. And you know what? A lot of people were ignorant and hadn't known the truth about what that does. But does it make it okay? It doesn't mean I'm not going to teach on it because you, you can't just be silent on things that make people uncomfortable. Because I'm sure anyone who's ignorant of that would have wanted to know that years before. I wish I would have just known that. I wish someone would have told me. Well, that's why I'm saying it tonight. I'm not trying to, to tear anybody down if you've already done anything like that in your past. But I'm still going to call the truth what it is. And I'm going to preach the Bible and say this is what God's Word says. And a life is a life. Be careful with the decisions that you make especially in regards to life and child rearing and childbirth. That moment at conception, there's a life. And once you have that life, we ought to be doing everything we can to sustain that life. Let's finish up the, the chapter here. Bible says in verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. Notice how Sam Gipp didn't read verse 24 either. He didn't read verse 21 where he was instructed that his name was going to be Jesus. He also didn't read verse 24 where it said, Joseph did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. He skips that verse intentionally and jumps to where he names him Jesus. In case you didn't catch that either. This is what a false prophet will do. And this is why it's important. I believe it's important as a preacher. And for anyone who's looking to learn how to preach, use Bible. 
and try to use Bible in context. And, you know, I, we jump around a little bit because it's important to make some points, but we really need, that's why I love the Bible studies, because we go through an entire chapter. You know, we're going to get the context of what's being taught so that, so that we're, you know, it's that much less likely that you're going to be taught something out of context that's not true. Jehovah's Witnesses are famous for doing that, teaching things just completely out of context. Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. So he did not know her. He did not consummate that marriage until after the birth of Jesus Christ. She was a virgin until after the birth. And also, I just want to point this out. It's the last thing. He was her firstborn son. There are some crazy Catholic teachings out there that want to teach that, G that Mary is like an eternal virgin. That she was just like maintain a virgin forever. It's not true. Because if she had a firstborn son, that means she had another son that was born. You can't have a firstborn without having a secondborn. Right. Make sense? Otherwise, you just say her only son, <laughs> not, not her firstborn. You don't put a first on something unless you have a second. So, which she did, and it's recorded. She had sons and daughters and, you know, other. Jesus had his, his half-siblings in this world. So she didn't remain a virgin. That marriage was consummated, but it wasn't consummated until after the birth of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great wisdom that you can teach us from your words. God, I pray that you please help us all to be diligent to search out the, every teaching that we hear and that we would take it upon ourselves to read your word, to know your word, Lord, and to um, just be vigilant. Be vigilant when we hear preaching and teaching and that we would... Uh, study it out and, and make sure we know whether what we hear is, is true. And we just ask that you would guide us with the Holy Spirit and um, Lord, help us to increase in our knowledge and our learning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.